All a writer needs is a room. I like to face a wall. It's a habit. If you create your own country, your own weather in front of a blank wall, and the wall has always been the same for me, whether in Paris, Spain, London, or here in Ireland. If I didn't need to write, I wouldn't write. I thought, um, I mean, I grew up with that notion of the artist in exile, and um, I thought that was ridiculous. Um, that um, you couldn't imagine an English writer or a French writer, in say somebody like Wahar Larkin, uh, having to go into exile, and. Uh, I think that um, a writer is in exile anyhow because uh, he's living in his mind um, and he's uh, working out of his mind and he's working in an artificial form. Um, and uh, it really doesn't matter much uh, where um, he lives. John McGarren is one of Ireland's most distinguished writers of fiction. He is the author of four novels and three story collections. For a time, an expatriate writer, he now lives with his wife, Madeline, near the town of Mohill in County Leitrim. For years, I actually never associated any place at home. It's actually wherever I uh, hung my hat. Home is where I live. Um, it's uh, now this place, though, when I bought the place and came to live here, uh, it's like many other things. It was a sort of an adventure, but it was an adventure that became my life without, um, in a way, knowing what I was letting myself in for. It's um, a small farm, uh, 50 acres. In England, we call it a small holding, and it's between two lakes. And uh, it's um, the sort of uh, country that I grew up in and that I know best and I'm very fond of. When I'm away from here, it's uh, the one place in the world that I think of as home. It's a place that you know that you'd always come back to, that you'll never leave. As I say around here, um, um, until the hearse comes. <laughs> I prefer living in the country than, um, I mean, though I've enjoyed cities and have lived many years in cities. Um, and if I was living in the country, it, is I always want to be near water. I've always been fascinated by water, and like most uh, fascinations, I'm not sure why I am. I think it's the um, whole sense of space and light, and I grew up on water. And even in places like London, I found myself gravitating towards the Thames, especially in London, that uh, area around Billingsgate and Lower Thames Street. There was a man I knew who said once that uh, best 10 years of his life was passed uh, looking from the bridge of Coot Hall into the Boyle River. And his only regret was that he didn't spend 10 more. And I'm afraid I could easily have been that man. I find it, uh, it's an enormous adventure uh, to live here. And I suppose, um, that I've always been um, attracted to the familiar rather than to the exotic. And I find it um, to actually uh, push a little store of knowledge farther is always uh, more interesting to me than actually venturing into the completely new. And I'd be much more interested in Leitrim than in Russia or China.
in Ireland, it's um, localities are the important thing. I mean, the, the, the life uh, of a certain community takes place within an area, in, within a locality. And um, everything is of passionate interest to the people in that locality, and nothing is of much interest uh, that happens outside it. But I think that's the same uh, anywhere. People say about Leitrim that when the crow flies over Leitrim, he has to take his lunch along. They say the same thing in Spain about the people of Granada, that when the eagle, it's much grander, of course, uh, that when the eagle flies over Granada, he has to take his cheese and bottle of wine. But the people are very interesting people around here. They're independent, they're proud, they're very free in a good way. Uh, and I'm one of them. Carrick and Shannon, where I went to school, is the county town in Leitrim. This is a smaller town of Mohol. I'm very fond of this town. It's not the usual long, desolate street of most Irish country towns, but the, the sort of crossroads. And the small streets uh, link perfectly into one another. I think that um, as a very happy town. It's market day today, it's market morning. The cabbage plants are out. Uh, there's the van outside Luke Early's. On market day, we always go for a few drinks to Luke's bar. And we always ask him, is he vexed yet? It's a an old routine. And Luke always says, no, I'm not vexed yet. Why aren't you vexed yet? It's not time to be vexed yet. When will it be time to be vexed, Luke? About three minutes to four now, I'll be very vexed. We're coming now to the very pretty Protestant church in a little graveyard garden here at the bottom of the town. Mall, I think, is about as far south as the Ulster plantation reached. And here you can actually find Protestants on small holdings, often as small as their Catholic neighbours. Now, darling, 45, 90 and a pound, 190, 11. What? Here, Terry. We'll do the trick. 325, Francis. Now, Terry. Patrick Cavanagh used to say that he liked travelling by bus so that he could look um, at the hedges. And I know exactly what he meant. They're full of life, uh, mice and birds, and the sparrowhawk can be seen hunting at all hours. Between the low drumlands um, are countless lakes. Uh, this lake below the house is um, Laura Lake. Uh, on the signposts, uh, and on the maps, it's called Loch Rowan. But nobody locally knows it any, as anything but um, Laura Lake, which is not Petrarch's Laura, but um, the middle lake in Gaelic, which Laura Loch, which is exactly what it is, um, a lake between two lakes. There's nothing dramatic at all about the landscape, but I think it's uh, never dull.
he actually couldn't be a loner and, and um, uh, live uh, here because, in a way, um, everybody in a community like this is, to some extent, interdependent. Um, I mean, if somebody comes for help, you help them, um, and you hope that they'll help you if you're in a fix, too. But then uh, I actually don't particularly like um, people in groups. I mean, I'm very fond of individual people, but um, I'm very fond of Young's work. And he says, uh, put a um, hundred intelligent men into a room, into the same room, and the level of conversation immediately falls to that area of the brain where water gathers. John McGahran was born in Leitrim in 1934. His father was a police sergeant, his mother a school teacher. At the age of 10, he moved with his family to the neighboring county of Roscommon and the village of Coote Hall. His first prize-winning novel, The Barracks, is set in this location. Often people think that uh, um, uh, Barracks is an um, autobiographical book, but in fact it's pure fiction. Naturally, uh, where you grew up, uh, the people around you, the clouds, the sky, the weather, everything uh, uh, influences you. And I think one's work uh, um, reflects that, but uh, I mean, they didn't uh, consciously influence one, um, and they certainly aren't consciously reflected. This is the day room of the barracks uh, in Coot Hall. Uh, my father was the sergeant here with three or four guards. We lived um, in quarters at the back. I would have known it most of my life. Uh, when my mother was alive, we used to come on holidays. Uh, and when she died, uh, we, and I was 10, we came here to live with my father. And we lived here. Um, until I was 18 when I went to Dublin. Um, of course, the room um, looked enormous then. It looks very small to me now. Um, this is where the guards um, conducted our business. One of them, the barrack orderly, had to sleep uh, beneath the phone there. Uh, he had to make up his bed um, and take down his bed every night, though my father, the sergeant, was sleeping at the back and nothing ever happened. There was a cell in there uh, that never had a prisoner, mostly mental, disturbed people uh, who were often violent, and they were kept in there before taking to mental hospitals. Um, uh, nothing ever happened. Um, they were lined up for inspection at 9 o'clock every morning after the barrack orderly, the BO, they used to call him, left up his bed. And uh, then they cycled out on empty roads on which nothing ever happened. And they came back here and wrote reports, uh, which they used to humorously call patrols of the imagination. The barrack orderly had to be here day and night. And the way he passed most of the day was standing at that window looking at who crossed the bridge of Coot Hall. And on good summer days, they'd take a chair outside the window and sit watching who crossed the bridge. There was one guard who was um, very malicious, uh, and he used to keep a running commentary right through the day on the various people who crossed the bridge. There was a very charming guard called Guard Canning. And um, um, I never met him at the time, but the librarian in Sligo told me that they, he was all the time borrowing the barracks out of the library. Um, and they had a special book because he just brought the barracks back and took it out again, and he had it for several years. And apparently, all he did was actually read what he thought was of himself. Uh, in the barracks, uh, um, since he said that he was the only one who got a good right hop on it, which is a bit like Mr. Elliot in uh, Jane Austen's Persuasion. My 
mother was a very gentle woman. Um, she was a school teacher. Um, we lived with her when we were very young. And she had a farm in County Leitrim, not too far from where I live now. And she, we used to come here on school holidays, and my father used to go to the farm on his holidays or days off. My father had very little um, strict work, I mean, just the appearances of work. Uh, and uh, when my mother was alive, uh, he mostly lived alone with a maid here. Um, and um, when um, she died, my five uh, sisters and my brother and myself lived here with my father. I mean, I think he was a complicated man. Um, uh, and he's uh, dead now, and I don't want to say too much about him. We had very few books. Uh, I suppose we had a couple of dozen, uh, mostly those blue-covered, uh, early Talbot Press books, mostly of patriotic nature. But there was a, a very, very charming Protestant family here called the Moronis, and they had a big library. Um, they had Shakespeare, they had Dickens, they had Scott, they had Isaiah Gray, they had a lot of books on the Rocky Mountains. I read them all like a um, boy watching television or going to the movies. I, mean, I found uh, them all uh, equally uh, pleasurable. I mean, I read uh, Shakespeare the same way as I read Isaiah Gray. On most uh, Sundays in summer, we drove up from the barracks in Coote Hall to Naficker Locks here, past uh, the gut and through Oakport Lake and past a place we used to call the Golden Bush. If we had a few coins in our pockets, uh, we'd buy um, biscuits and lemonade at the post office in Naficker. That was a huge treat then. I remember the old boat was tarred, and in hot weather like this, uh, we'd have to wear very old clothes because the tar missed it. I think uh, of this as a very English part of the country. Uh, Stafford King Harmons in um, Rockingham House on the fishing rights as far as Nafika Bridge here. And I think uh, their influence is everywhere the trees, the locks, uh, the water. Rockingham House itself burned down in 1956, and the Stafford King Harmons are gone. But I think uh, their influence is everywhere still. This is Gloria Bog, a mile from Coot Hall. All the guards, like the rest of the people, used to cut their turf here. We cut the turf and wheeled it out on wheelbarrows and scattered and footed and clamped them and then drew them out to the road with donkeys. It was heartbreaking work and the donkeys were always sinking in the soft ground and sometimes they'd break legs. Yet I love this place, I love the stunted birch trees and the beautiful old graveyard of Killeelan that dominates the place. And I don't think the wild raspberries ever tasted sweeter any place else than here. I've never been able to um, write uh, for more than two hours in a day. Um, I mean, I mean, uh, real writing, if uh, one was 
working on a movie, say, or a film script, or criticism, or journalism of some sort, one can work uh, 10 or 12 hours a day. But for the type of writing, like writing a novel or a story, is that you're simply spent after two, two hours. And generally, I like to work in the morning. Naturally, your own life is going to get into the books since um, I think that uh, every character uh, a fictional writer invents, and after all, I am a fictional writer, uh, is that um, it takes um, three or four people um, to um, make up a character because, I mean, a single... Uh, drawing from life is always far too thin for fiction. And I suspect, I mean, there's no way you can know this, that uh, a large part of uh, every character is uh, oneself. I, mean, I don't understand um, um, this thing about um, rural writers. Uh, are urban writers. I mean, I think that you hear a lot of that about that nowadays, and I actually think that's uh, nonsense. Um, is that more than there's Irish writers or Russian writers? I mean, uh, I think there's just good writers and bad writers, and one wants to read good writers, and it actually, naturally, uh, a writer's world is going to reflect the society he came out of. Uh, but it actually doesn't matter what that society is. Um, is, um, I mean, that the quality of the language and the quality of the seeing is always far more important than the material. John McGarren's second novel, The Dark, was banned in Ireland in 1965. He was sacked by the Catholic clergy from his post as a school teacher in Dublin. Following a public outcry, he left Ireland to live and work abroad. Well, I had a very sort of strange meeting with the uh, general body at the time. And there was um, the secretary was a man called Kelleher at the time. And he um, said, no, he said, well, wouldn't mind an old book getting banned. He says, well, we might be able to do something about that. That doesn't count. He says, but I hear you got married to a foreign woman in a registry office. <laughs> and he said, um, uh, what possessed you, he says, to marry a foreign woman, he says, with hundreds uh, of thousands of Irish women going around with their tongues out for a husband. I thought it was an extraordinary phrase. For unfortunately, I never noticed that the tongues out were never much in my direction. <laughs> I mean, there was a very sort of strange Archbishop, which was Archbishop McQuaid in Dublin at the time. And actually, it was he gave the order for my uh, dismissal, because <laughs> the old parish priest uh, who did sack me um, actually said that he did not think he gets me, but uh, he had got his orders from the Archbishop. Oh, it's a completely changed Ireland. Um, um, I feel, um, I mean, I don't feel I know that I grew up um, in the 19th century. Um, you know, it was an insecure state. And um, the English had gone. And um, I mean, the, an insecure state um, allied itself with an um, inward looking church. And they kept uh, a society frozen in time into the 1960s. I actually couldn't say um, um, anything about my own writing, you know, because simply I just try to write, um, and I try to get it right, um, but it's for other people to, to say what my writing is about. Um, I mean, I simply write out of a world um, in my head. 
I mean, in a way, I think um, the only difference between the writer and the reader is that the writer has the knack of putting down that interior world into paper that the um, reader uh, brings um, that interior world um, to the books that they read. Because in a way, you read um, a book with your whole life, with your experiences, rather than with uh, French or English. Generally, something is in your head for seven or eight years before you can write about it. I mean, the only definition of what you write about, as far as I can understand, is that something is in your head long enough and it won't go away. And you have to write it to see what is there. Um, and it's only when you write it that you know whether the event is useful or not. You can only write out of um, um, what you know. But then um, it's lived um, in your head for so long is that it becomes something different, uh, I mean, almost sometimes completely different um, than how that life uh, first began because it's fed uh, by invention, by imagination, as well as by memory. This is a very short paragraph from the new novel, but it's close to its heart, our central theme. But as the small, tight group of stricken women slowly left the graveyard, they seemed with every step to be gaining in strength. It was as if their first love and allegiance had been pledged uncompromisingly to this one house and man, and that they knew that he had always been at the very living centre of all parts of their lives. Now, not only had they never broken that pledge, but they were renewing it for a second time with this other woman who had come in among them and married him. Their continual homecomings had been an affirmation of its unbroken presence. And now, as they left him under the yew, it was as if each of them in their different ways had become daddy. 